All right, so another major part of the hero's journey, Shoujo does tend to reinforce stereotypes about female actions and culture, right? Girls transform through a magical compact, or a magical mirror, or um, other magical things that are very domestic. Even perhaps more damning than that, um, think of Sailor Moon, the, in, in Magical Girl especially, the girl always does her combat in some little pocket dimension, which nobody else sees. And when all is said and done, outside of her little you know, group of people, and maybe some other people in some fantasy world, nobody in the real world knows what she did. She may have saved the world as long as nobody in the rest of the world has to ever know about it. Right? So there is very much this pushing of the female characters aside in a larger cultural context, which is unfortunate. We're seeing some of that change a little bit now and again, but it is certainly a thing where, and, and you see a lot of this um, commentary in Japan, folks being increasingly concerned about the fact that shoujo's series can, girl-focused anime series do not feature the girl saving the world in an obvious physical way compared to shonen series, look at Dragon Ball Super, right? All these people know Goku and they know that he saved the world. People in magical girl shows generally don't. Despite the fact that he did kind of hit and hide uh, uh, himself for all that. But you get the idea. Yes? How would you compare that um, to, I guess, American comics kind of? Uh, mm. The empowerment of, is, I mean, good and bad. Right. Um, so I, I'll preface this by saying that I don't need that much American comics. Um, but I, we have our own issues we're working through, I think. We're trying to have more empowered female characters, but I think there, there, there's still a lot of female characters. Right. Um, I think there are a lot of female characters. The problem we have in superhero comics, especially, is that generally when, pe when women have been written in superhero comics, they've generally been written as simply male superheroes with female attributes. They haven't been thought through as female characters in that sense. And this is all sort of gender politics and what makes a woman and a man all kind of, it gets complicated. Um, it's Pac-Man, Pac exactly. Um, so one of, the, one of the issues is that we're having a very difficult time over here figuring out what a female superhero looks like. Exactly, and the, the whole macho culture, which is a very big thing because over here, what, female superheroes do exactly what male superheroes do. They punch things and kick things. Over there, they do completely different things. Who here has seen Princess Tutu? There we go, some of it. You know, Princess Tutu doesn't fight her enemies, she talks them through their problems, which is awesome. So, and, and, and again, which is not to say that women can't fight, is to say that girls' shows are willing to deal, to present different kinds of conflicts than shows for boys. And explore different kinds of concept, uh, conflicts in that. Basically, girls can do anything as long as they're well, Exactly, and that's, that's, that's the whole complexity of it. Yeah. Anyway, so, Shoujo has some awesome things, but also some complex things that have to represent girls. Um, Alright, and speaking of which, holy smokes, we can have romance and boy shows in Japan. Um, apparently, over here, as soon as you have, you, you even hint, that two characters are, like, are having a good time or are, you know, like each other, all the boys will shut off the television, right? And no girls will watch. Nah, not really. Um, they're much more willing to have these sort of concepts in, even in boy shows um, in, in Japan. In other words, there's a much more speci there's, there's much more crossover between these elements in anime versus the West. We tend to sort of separate, like, if, if there's romance, it goes in a girl's show. If there's action, it goes in a boy show. And they're willing to kind of cross the streams, if you will. Um, yeah, for in the West, a right. lot of it is about instant satisfaction, right. romance. We don't want to have to work for it. That's, that's very true. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's an important point. One second. Uh, it's an important point about the fact that, you know, getting back to that earlier point, think about a... Is there a single American television show it is, it is a romance. Just a romance. I can't think of one, right? But they're all over the place in, in anime. Um, so, because if we have romance over here, it's this sort of side story. It's this little thing. Whereas in Japan, it can be the, it can be the, the whole thing. Yes, you have it. What would Ray Earth belong to? 
Ray Earth. Where would Ray Earth fall? Ray Earth is, in my opinion, actually a commentary on and deconstruction of shoujo. Because Ray Earth's point is that the girls are brought into this fantasy world to fulfill more shonen archetypes of being more fighters. Um, and the whole point is that they're tricked, <laughs> spoiler alert, um, they're tricked into doing that to do something that undermines a female character at the very end that they don't want to have to, have to happen, and it happens anyway. And at the end, they're just set. This isn't really a spoiler. The last panel of Ray Earth is the three girls standing around crying, saying, it can't end this way. That's the first part. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. Um, but I mean, that's the... And they got that's where they go. They got Mecca. They got Mecca. And then they got Mecca, which is pretty awesome. Um, so yes, no, Ray Earth is definitely playing around with those, those stereotypes. And part of the point of Ray Earth was, was to highlight some of these oddities about Chojo. Let's talk about the nobility of failure. Um, so there's this interesting trend in, in Japanese culture in general, and this is the, the most commonly translated, the most common translation of the phrase the nobility of failure. The idea that we, you'll have a story about somebody who holds very strongly to an ideal that fails utterly in every possible sense, and they die, and their kids die, and their family dies, and their dog dies, and just complete nothing works out. Uh, a perfect example of this is the Shinsen Gumi. Um, they've been adapted in a couple of different anime series. Uh, you've seen them in Rony Kenshin, and a couple other things. Uh, this is from Hatsuoki, I believe. Um, the Shinsen Gumi were a group of essentially special forces samurai uh, that were put together when um, just before Japan opened, opened itself up to the West. So Admiral Perry had come in, they knew the West was out there, they had to deal with it, they weren't sure what was going to happen, and various pro-emperor forces were trying to basically um, unseat the shogun from power and change the whole, um, uh, the whole political structure of Japan, and so the Shinsengumi were formed to basically say, okay, you're going to find the rebels and kill them, you're going to keep the, company, the country stable, you're going to make sure that everything stays the way it's supposed to be. That didn't work out so well, as you can imagine. Uh, the, uh, the forces of history were completely arrayed against them. They were some of the best samurai and some of the best men in Japan in the sense that they believed what they were doing was right. They were noble. They were serious. They really tried to do the right thing. But it didn't work out. Now, they weren't able to stop some of the downright terrorist actions of these rebels. But ultimately... Japan opened us up, up to the West, the Shogun was deposed, the Emperor came, kind of came back in power, um, and the Shinsengumi complete, completely failed utterly. It just, they were doomed. Most of them died. And that is a theme you see over and over in Japanese stories. This ability and willingness to focus on people who don't really accomplish anything. <laughs> As much as I love this show, what does Spike Spiegel actually accomplish? Or Faye, or any of the others, right? This is about people who just kind of existed for a while, really. And it's, you know, we all think it's brilliant, right? And because we see how they treat those characters as characters. We can tell a story about characters even if they're not changing the world. All right, so let's talk a little bit about different approaches to storytelling. I cribbed this entirely from Susan Napier's book, Anime from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle, these, uh, th these three concepts, um, that there are these overall sort of story structures with a lot of these things. Um, an apocalyptic tone, a festival tone, and she calls it elegaic, but no one uses that word, so I say nostalgic. I would say, well... Most anime can be grouped in one of these three groups, which is kind of unusual for stuff. Apocalyptic, oh boy. Mecha, Gundam. And it's interesting how often science fiction in anime is apocalyptic. There aren't a lot of happy, happy, joy, joy science fiction series in Japan. There's almost always an apocalyptic tone. I think this does go back to World War II and to the fact that, and to Japan's militarism in the early 20th century, there, so from the 1860s through the 1940s, 
they, they had great strides in industry and technology, which also coincided, not, not intentionally, but there were certainly forces at, um, at work with the rise of militarism. Right? So they saw all this technology grow along with all of these, this imperialism and militarism and conquering things. And so they see the downside of technology. The technology enables you to do more things and more destructive things besides just more good things. Right? Then, of course, there are the festival anime. Harvey Suzumi would be a perfect example of that. A show that is just about celebrating life, celebrating reality, celebrating other people around you. I mean, arguably, based on the movie, you know, the theme of Harvey Suzumiya is enjoy where you are. Enjoy who you're with and what you're actually doing right now. Obviously, there doesn't have to be an actual festival in the show as Haruhi has, but the, the, that, that overall tone. You see this a lot in anime of the 70s. Uh, a lot of the romantic, romantic comedies and things like that, they're very festival in tone. And then you have the anime that are more nostalgic about the past. We're even nostalgic about um, uh, the present. You got it? Cool. Oh, 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 oh. You forgot Gigi. <laughs> cool. Um, so you know, Totoro is very much about the fact and trying to evoke what Japan was like in the 50s and 60s. This post-war period that was very um, peaceful, that was rebuilding, and where you could have a very calm, nice, normal life living in the country. It is worth noting that both Satsuki and Mei would have been born post-war. They never knew what the war was like. And that is one of the concepts of Totoro is you see no references whatever to World War II in Totoro. It's not about that. And then, of course, there's anime that's all three of these all at once.